Thank you, Mr. Hervani. Mr. Hervani, you're up first. Uh, thank you very much for the consortium, uh, Bradley. Thank you, Jerry. And uh, thank you, Representative Seabury. It's nice to see you. Um, and thank you guys for coming out. Uh, there are three main reasons that I've uh, put myself uh, into this race in 2010. Uh, number one, we need an alternative to Republicans and Democrats. Um, we've seen what they can do for the past 10 years. And the problem is when they're both wrong, we don't have a, a voice to counter them. Um, they're both wrong on bank bailouts. They've both been wrong on uh, invasions, uh, costly invasions into the Middle East. And we need a voice that's going to question Republicans when Republicans are wrong and Democrats when Democrats are wrong. Um, and what we have right now is a $14 trillion debt that is a default of both Republicans and Democrats. Um, secondly, I'd like to see more libertarian principles in the federal government. That's uh, what the Tea Party is about. It's about preparing this Constitution, keeping the federal government limited as uh, the founding fathers intended. And uh, the last reason, of course, I'm 27 years old. I am a media entrepreneur here in central Ohio. I uh, work in Washington, D.C. And I'm ready to get young people's perspective into the federal government. Thank you. Thanks, Jerry. Thanks for the consortium of the local community council for inviting me tonight. Uh, I'm having flashbacks, uh, as I said, in this room. Uh, when I was young, this was a library. I mean, I spent a lot of time here when it was the live the Northland Library before it moved on to Carl Road. And that kind of demonstrates uh, a little bit, for those of you who don't know, my roots in this area. Uh, having grown up here in the Northland area, my parents still live around the corner. I uh, spent a lot of time at this library, graduated from Northland High School. Uh, had my first job just down the road at McDonald's. And, and uh, second job at a, a gas station around the corner on Cleveland Avenue. So this community shaped me, it helped make me what I am today. And I tried to give back to this community, whether it was President of Forest Park Civic Association or whether it was Northland Community Council or starting the Northland Area Business Association. And that community involvement has continued on to this day. My campaign office is in this community, has been from the very beginning, as is my district office, my congressional district office. So this community has provided a lot of uh, opportunity for me and we've been giving a lot back. Thank you. First question to you, Mr. T. Berry. What do you think ought to be done to bring jobs back? Boy, first and foremost, we have to provide certainty. Over the last couple of years, entrepreneurs and job creators are yelling and screaming about the uncertainty in Washington, whether it's taxes that are going up, aside from the taxes that are going up on January 1st, the biggest tax time bomb in our recent history of taxes that are going up. We've had other taxes that have been pr proposed. Taxes that have been passed over the last two years. We have the regulatory environment in Washington that is, is very anti-entrepreneurial very anti-job creator. In fact, I had a, uh, a gentleman say to me, this kind of sums it all up in, in, a, in a story, in Reynoldsburg, Ohio, earlier this year, that had I had a, a dream, and my wife and I had started a business in our garage. In 2009, we had our best year ever. But because of the uncertainty in the tax code, because of the uncertainty of the regulatory, what, regulatory environment, whether it's forced unionization, or whether it's cap and trade, causing electricity rates to go up. I had my best year ever and we didn't hire anybody. We hired temporary staff people, but no permanent jobs. This is somebody who could add permanent employees and expand his job list. But because of the environment in Washington and that uncertainty, he and his wife were sitting on their hands. And the worst part of the story, Jerry, was he said that my wife and I were talking to dinner the other night, this is back in March, and if we had to start our business today, like we did 10 years ago, we wouldn't do it. That's an indictment of what's happening in Washington, D.C. with killer taxes and with the regulatory environment that doesn't help entrepreneurs and job creators. So first and foremost, we have to stop the madness of what's happening to job-killing tax proposals and regulatory proposals. And then after that, we have to understand that we are competing with people all over the world, and we have to understand that and fix our tax code and fix our regulatory environment to make sure that jobs stay in America and jobs come to America and jobs come to Ohio. Thank you, Mr. Mervine. Uh, well, as a libertarian candidate, um, I think uh, Mr. T. Berry and I are going to agree uh, on a lot of things. Um, as a small businessman, as a self-employed person myself, uh, yes, regulations, taxes, I've gone all, all over this district and it, I'm encountering the same stories. The, the self-employed and the people who are trying to run small businesses are hurting. 
And uh, I know Mr. Tebrick probably is against it, as well as healthcare legislation that just went through. This is about to kill small businesses as well. So my stance is, is a lot uh, similar. It's we need to kill the, the job killing uh, regulations and taxes. My problem is, is that the Republicans had a chance to do that when they were in control of the federal government from 2000 to 2006, and they didn't. So to just come out now and say that they're going to do it, I feel it's too little too late. We need to get uh, people who understand the free market into the legislature, into the federal government, to efficiently uh, bring down these regulations and taxes. Thank you. Next question for you first, Mr. Irvine. The repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell has been hotly debated this year and has been featured on the front page of many newspapers. Give us your position on repealing Don't Ask, Don't Tell. I feel it should be repealed. Um, at, as several people in my generation know, um, usually you can tell if somebody is gay or not. And for the most part, my generation, we don't care. We don't care about it if they are. What matters is that they actually serve well. If they serve well, then they're doing their job. It's time to be socially tolerant, and that's certainly something that libertarians advocate for. We are socially liberal, fiscally conservative. And this comes into an issue of uh, gay rights. And we certainly support uh, gays serving freely and openly in the military if they choose to do so. They should not be scrutinized or regulated by the government for being who they are. Thank you, Mr. T. Barry. I uh, want to mention one thing from the last question, Jerry, and then I'll answer the question is, in January of 2007, when Nancy Pelosi became speaker, and your old boss, Chuck Schumer, who was a Democrat congressional chairman for the Senate, unemployment was 4.6%. So when Republicans lost control, unemployment was 4.6%. It's now over double that, and it has been for the last 16 months. Uh, I'm open to this, but here's the most important part of this answer, is that the Pentagon, led by the Secretary of Defense, who was appointed by the President of the United States, said at the beginning of this year that we should do a study for the President's request on this particular issue. And that study would be done on behalf of members of the service, their, their husbands and wives, and, and their children, the dependents of our armed forces to see what impact they thought this would have on them, those who are serving, both gay and straight. That study will be done at the end of this year. When Speaker Pelosi brought this issue up several months ago in legislation, because earlier she said that this was going to be not dealt with until the study was complete, the four chiefs of the services of the United States military urged the president, urged the speaker, urged the Senate Majority Leader to not make this a political issue. But this was too important for the men and women, gay and straight, who serve in the military, to make it a political issue before this study was completed and before the input, private input, of the men and women of our armed services and their dependents. That study is not complete. Unfortunately, this became a political issue, and that's why I voted no, because the study has not been complete. But I'm looking forward to see the study, to see what members of our armed services say what their families say about the impact of this on them. Those are our war fighters. Those are the ones that are in the field. They're defending our country. They're in tough places today. We should have their input. Thank you. The next question for you first, Mr. T. Berry. When healthcare reform really begins starting 2014, how do you propose filling the access gap when there are not enough doctors to provide the care? That's one of the many reasons, Jerry, why I voted against it. I think it's a real problem. And in fact, today, 3M Corporation, a company out of Minnesota, an American manufacturer, told their retirees that beginning in 2013, that they will no longer be offering health care benefits for their retirees. And we warned, actually, of the supporters of this law in Washington that this is one of the detrimental impacts mm -hmm. of this bill. And there are many detrimental impacts. Listen, I think the president, at the beginning of the process, outlined the problems pretty well. And, and those problems, unfortunately, with the passage of this bill, remain today. We're not going to see health care costs going down. We're not going to see insurance costs going down. We're not going to see uh, people having better access. We're going to see people have access. Medicaid is, is access today. The federal government says Medicaid is broken. So what does this bill do? It adds 16 to 18 million more people 
to what the federal government already says is a broken mm -hmm. system. You don't have to go far in Columbus, Ohio to find a doctor or a hospital employee tell you that Medicare, or excuse me, Medicaid is a broken system. We don't fix it. We add to the burden of this problem. And the, the access issue to physicians, Jerry, is a real one. If you talk to physicians today, uh, there are many physicians who are, who are concerned about the, the impact on this bill to their practice. They're already struggling in many cases, particularly primary care physicians. And so I think you're gonna see, uh, unfortunately, fewer physicians practicing medicine in America because of this bill, unless we can fix it. Thank you, Mr. Irvine. The same question. When healthcare reform really begins starting 2014, how do you propose to fill the access gap when there are not enough doctors to provide care? Uh, like Pat, a big problem, and I also would have voted against this healthcare legislation. The, the, the problem here, though, is that the federal government can't be involved in this process any longer. Since the federal government has been involved in the healthcare business since the 1960s, uh, health care has gotten more expensive and it's gotten more costly for, for everybody in America. The whole idea of uh, government intrusion on health care is part of the problem, especially at the federal level. There's nothing in this United States Constitution that says the federal government should be responsible for the health care of all the people in the nation. Now, that being said, it is something that can be left up to the states. That is certainly something that's, that's okay. And more so, it, it would probably be more efficient and less costly for people who want the government to be involved in their health care. But this is something uh, I would have voted against the health care legislation. But uh, in addition, I've, uh, we put out today, my campaign has put out today a, uh, a plan to uh, bring down federal spending. Uh, I have not seen plans from the Republicans or Democrats uh, in this race or anywhere else all over the country that actually brings, brings down federal spending. And one of the areas that we start to phase out is Medicaid and Medicare. It's a very, it's a trillion, it's almost a trillion dollar department within our federal government. If you look at any federal government spending graph, you'll see it's right, right up there, it's right at the top. And we can't afford it anymore. It's too costly, and it's something that if the states wish to have it, then they should be allowed, but the federal government needs to be phased out of the healthcare business entirely. Thank you. This next question to you first, Mr. Irvine. Will you commit to protecting Social Security and to not privatizing its funds? Uh, I cannot uh, commit to protecting Social Security. Uh, unfortunately, um, it is another unsustainable program that the federal government has undertaken, and for 75 years now, it is on its way to bankruptcy. Uh, that being said, in the federal budget that we proposed today, that we sent out today, we do not touch Social Security because I have parents and I understand that they've paid into it their whole life and we need to honor those benefits. And we need to honor those benefits for as long as we can, but in the next two years that I will be serving in Congress, I will try to propose an opt-out plan because several people my age understand that we are paying into this, and I've already been paying into it for years, but there's a very real possibility that I will never see that money. And that is a huge concern for a lot of people my age. Um, that being said, again, I support taking care of the people who have paid into it, but it's gotta be a gradual, phased out program so that by the time it is bankrupt, by 2037, um, we won't have to deal with that anymore. Again, in terms of the United States Constitution, it is not defined in the Constitution that the federal government should be undertaking a program like this, but again, I support states' rights to have a program like this if they would like. Similarly uh, to the last answer, it'll be better run, more efficient if you do it at the state level. It'd be a long process, and I understand that, um, but it is something we should put on the table of phasing it out and allowing people to do what they want with that money when they have the chance, when they're working.